Donna Schwartz here from the Everything Saxophone Podcast. We are at the NAM 2024 show. All of the podcast episodes at the NAM 2024 show are sponsored by Rovner Products, celebrating their 50th anniversary. Well, I'm so happy to say this is the first time I've caught them at NAM. I'm at the JJ Babbitt booth, and I'm here with Steve and Trace Rory over here, and you're going to see Mike Smith. There we go. <laughs> He's going to be doing some demos for us later on so welcome to the podcast guys thank you thanks we appreciate it yeah <laughs> awesome cool so you've got some new offerings that everybody's going to want to know about i mean we all know the jj babbitt name we know about the meyer mouthpieces the height mouthpieces the auto links but i think we're going to be featuring the auto links because yeah some really great history with this too auto links have been around for 70 or so years yeah mm -hmm. that's correct yeah that's yep. crazy, but what I didn't know until I spoke to Trace yesterday, I didn't realize there were actually five iterations. Let's talk about that. So some, as we've studied our own internal history, specifically with the Supertone Master and the Florida, we've been able to track internally, even though they weren't officially designated as the Florida 1, the Florida 2, the Florida 3, but there had been iterative adjustments and changes to continue to perfect it throughout its history. So as we track that history, we knew that as of recently, we wanted to go back and take a look at the forging dies, some of the tooling that have made these mouthpieces iconic because the process for making these mouthpieces over time, it's a pretty violent process, and the tooling can wear and degrade over time, which requires a lot of extra handwork post the forging process, which we're a, a, a shop that does all handwork anyways. So we're not looking for just uh, machinery to create something automatically. We will forge these mouthpieces and then do a lot of handwork after the forging. But what we were having to do was begin to correct more and more and more of the work that was coming out of these forging dies. So we said, look, we need to get back to original specifications so that we can find that proper balance between what the forging dies are doing and then the handwork that we're putting into it, which is extensive still to, to handcraft these things. So as we track the history, we saw, okay, there's been four kind of progressions of this. And since we're going back to the original specifications of all of these and making sure that they're coming off the forging dies pristine, then we said, you know what? It's appropriate for us to call these the Florida Five and the Super Tone Master Five to just designate what that is, yeah. Awesome, can you talk, this is interesting to me. So you're going back to the original specifications. How hard, how hard was it to do that to get everything up up to the up to the old specs, so to yeah. speak? Yeah, great question. I'm going to stop talking for a second. What we do is we have, even though we're a very old world kind of process and very handcrafted, we're utilizing some very modern day techniques in order to make sure that we can recapture those specifications. And what you do is you go grab some of the originals because our our museum, so to speak, of product is extensive. And so we can go back and grab some of the originals from those early days, and then we can take them to an organization we work with, and we can CAT scan them. So it's oh, a wow. CT scan, just like you'd run into in a hospital. Wow. Otherwise, to get on the inside and really get minute measurements, you'd have to cut them open. Well, cutting open a metal mouthpiece is yeah. not the best thing for it. Yeah. And so uh, we, we CAT scan them now so that we can really duplicate those internal dimensions. And then we take those dimensions, we feed them into our CAD CAM system so that we can then render drawings. And from those drawings, we can then recreate the, the forging dies, as Trace mentioned, that we then use to create the metal halves. Autolink mouthpieces, like, unlike many of our, unlike mo all of our competitors that make metal mouthpieces out of one piece of brass rod, we forge them out of two halves and then we braze them together to create the full size mouthpiece. That's interesting. What what um, what is the reasoning for that compared to just one brass rod? Well. Back in the day when they were made, CNC machines didn't exist. That's true, yeah. <laughs> and so we were using the process that, that we could, that existed, okay. uh, and that was making them in halves. And then the other part of it is the thing that I've always believed, I think CNC machining is fine, but the difficulty of actually creating near perfect or perfect internal dimensions, you're trying to get to the inside from each end of the piece because you can't penetrate it from anywhere other than either end, and then you're trying to create those dimensions just from the inside, almost blindly. Oh, yeah, okay. Because you can't see on the inside while the machining work is being done. 
Whereas when you're doing it in halves with it laid open, you can get to exactly every nook and cranny of the mouthpiece because it's available to you at that time. That is very cool. And you know, I'm just thinking out loud, thinking in my head too, so many people have used the auto links, you know, and what do you feel made them so special? that so many people have been drawn to the Autolink name and the Autolink mouthpieces? That's a phenomenal question, and I'm going to hand this microphone to our <laughs> iconic saxophone player over here, Mike Smith, to answer that question, because this guy is a legend in his own right and understands the full history of these as well. Um, I, th I think going all the way back to Coleman Hawkins, you know, um, it was one of the first mouthpiece companies that would work with musicians. So they all worked with Autolink. They came in, he did specs, made mouthpieces for them, and that's why, and then since Coleman Hawkins, which we all know was probably one of the, almost the fathers of of modern kind of jazz playing. Yeah. And then, you know, Coltrane, Stanley Turrentine, Sonny Stitt, I mean, it goes on and on. The whole lineage was Otto Link for tenor. Yeah, for sure. And that's, and, that's why and I asked And Meyer, Meyer on alto, so... Right, you Cannibal know. Adelaide, yeah, yeah. And so, and, and the Frank Meyer and Otto Link were good friends and worked together. So that's, that was kind of the combination. Even though they had set their own separate companies, they were a part of it. But it's the lineage. And it's still that way today. Who's, who's playing what, you know, and that's... Right, that's true. And when you ask why it was, because there, there wasn't much before Otto Link. There were, you know, there were some things, some mouthpieces, but as far as going into a jazz thing with the baffles and that didn't really exist before then. We were playing, you know, also know, mouthpieces that Adolf Sachs developed when he developed the instrument. Right, right. And it didn't fit the... It didn't it, it, fit that style of music that it, where it was going. Yeah. You know, big open chambers and dark, more, you know, it's like a classical mouthpiece. Yeah, yeah. So what you, what's really interesting is when you think back to those times, it isn't like they, Otto Link and Meyer were trying to create mouthpieces to meet the current sound of the day. They were literally creating the current sound of the day. That's a great, yeah, that's a great way of saying it. That's true. So as Otto Link and Meyer became synonymous with jazz, they literally formed the jazz sound that all of us look back on and know and love and are trying to replicate in many ways these days. These mouthpieces and these brands actually literally helped create that sound that everybody's trying to replicate now. And, and we feel a profound responsibility to steward that history and that legacy and that iconic sound in what we do now, but to continue to help it take steps forward as well in this modern age. So. Absolutely. That's awesome. All right. Well, let's talk about, I think the first mouthpiece we have up is the LA. That's correct. All right. And we've got the backdrop over there too, <laughs> which is great. Let's talk about this mouthpiece. Well, the LA is basically, it has uh, the qualities of the tone edge, the regular hard rubber, like gets played and everything, only with a little more material in the, in the baffle. And so, and some other dimensions that are different and it's going to give it a little bright, brighter sound. Got it. Hence the name L.A., because we wanted it to be a more, you know, for that kind of quality, more high-end. Got it. the bottom the roundness of the tone yeah but a little more sparkle in the upper end yeah and that's perfect actually I'm just thinking about yeah. that because the sound first of all you sound awesome of course but um, gosh I hear has so much history mm -hmm. <laughs> that sound yeah we wanted to make sure that it still had the core characteristics of an auto link that allows a player to be able to fit with the jazz ensemble and create that deep bass that robust kind of foundational sound you can hear when he eases off of it, it has a classic auto link 
classic jazz sound, but we wanted an added register to it. So when you really want to kick it and punch it hard, it will then cut and drive and has a little bit more edge to it than Autolink has really ever been known for, these Autolink hard rubbers. So it's perfect for the musician that wants to blend in with the jazz ensemble, but when it's time to lay into it and stand out and have a little bit of edge to it, it has that color on its palette as well. Yeah. That's perfect because I was going to ask you about I was going to ask you about the the sound profile. Who would this best be for? And especially with uh, you know music, the music of today, the you know contemporary pop music and and all that kind of thing. This can definitely work for yeah. sure because it could cut through. Yeah, so far uh, what we've tried to do is we had goals with this mouthpiece and in our internal testing we felt like it was meeting the needs of that type of player that wanted to have the, the nice classic jazz sound but then when it was time to punch it kick it hard they could stand out above so whether you're playing jazz or blues or rock or pop it's diverse enough to do that but I don't like to kind of uh, lead the witness, so to speak. So as we've had players play them here and said, okay, what do you think? Describe to us how it plays and what it does. They've described that back to us without us ever having to prompt them on what the goal is. So we feel pretty good that it's accomplishing that goal. Yeah. That's perfect, that's perfect. All right, awesome, let's get to the next mouthpiece. Master. And basically, we feel like this is just kept right up with it. The Tone even Master, though, yes. Even though we're in, in the five series, which we tried to capture the the way it was. Some of the dimensions have been changed a little bit to tighten it up. That's because over the years, as the mold, as, as, as the casting got bigger, you know, so we brought it back to the original, so. Got it. Really nice subtone on that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that sounded awesome. And then now we have the Florida. And Mike, as you're getting as you're getting the mouthpieces ready and stuff like that, um, what are your impressions as you're you know you're playing this five series, so to speak, these newer mouthpieces compared to what you've played in the My past? My older mouthpieces. Um, yeah. I feel like they're very close to what I played, and some of mine are really old. I have some. Old, I have a, a tone master from the '50s, and you know, so very, very, very coming right back to, which was the goal. That's what we wanted. We didn't want to come out with a whole because you know, it's a, such an iconic mouthpiece, the Auto Link. That yeah. Someone, now let me ask you this question: Someone you know maybe never tried Auto Link before. What what's the experience in terms of like maybe resistance levels or? You know, is it very free blowing? I'm gonna say it's not, but you know what yes. I'm saying. Like, what's the experience? Well, the, the the I think you know it's different for everybody, right? And, and we're all we're all unique, you know, all depending on how how we're built up here. That's why there's so many ways to go in mouthpieces too. Why there's so many sizes? Right. Why can Ernie Watts play a 13, and other guys like Coltrane was playing on like a five, or six? Right. Right. That's true. That's you true. Know? And it's all whatever read. Some people like hard reads. Some people like a real soft read. So what are what are the uh, the mouthpiece the sizes the tip opening sizes? Right now I'm playing on sevens. Got it. Okay, seven like a 105 tip opening or 100. Yeah, yeah, 100, 105. You know, in that it ballpark, seven, seven star. I just okay. picked out fives because this is what my normal piece is usually a seven star. Got it. Okay, 105 but, tip opening. But these are sevens that I'm playing on. Got it. More sparkle to it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you know, for and sure. If we have a minute to I'd also like to talk a little bit on Meyer. Absolutely. Because, you know, a lot of people want to know what's the difference between, you know, we've got three levels of Meyer now. You know, you get our first, the, the first, our, ge our general Meyer, then we have Meyer New York, and now last year we came out with Meyer Connoisseur, which is the same thing. We came back, we went back to the 
old, the exact old specifications like Cannonball and Phil Woods, those guys were all playing in. Yeah. And I don't know if you've ever seen the photographs with Phil, with Cannonball, he had a metal band on the shank of, of his mouthpiece because it was cracked and repaired. But I, as ex, through experimentation, we found out that having that little brass band on the back gives a little more center to the tone. Just hold up that mouth. Gives a little more center to the sound, and and a little better pro- projection. So this is the Meyer connoisseur. Meyer connoisseur, great. <laughs> on that <laughs> he could play yes <laughs> well, uh, the, the kind of sort of a lot of people say well so what's the difference it's it's more centered more compact um, and it, it also does a lot more projection but still has all the warmth and everything of the mire so and you know I guess like think very reminiscent of what cannonball and Phil were playing yeah, for and sure. even beyond that retention ring, that has unique tonal characteristics. But we add internal manufacturing process to it as well, extra vulcanization time, a uh, vulcanization time, and things things that add value to the overall tone. We add process to it to make that, and that again differentiates it from the standard Meyer versus the Meyer Bros connoisseur and everything. So, yeah. So interesting. This is so awesome. All right, cool. So now, what else? What else have we not covered? I think we've just about covered oh, it all. The new stuff. It. Yeah. Awesome. So. <laughs> So listen, I wanted to thank you all. Come in and come in. Come on. A, <laughs> Mike's over there. He's, he's getting his, his stuff going on over here. Listen, I wanted to thank you guys so much. Um, we had to try to do this before the show started because the noise level at Nam is it's just loud. It's beyond loud. It's ridiculous. We're going to be our ears are going to be ringing for days. But <laughs> yep. I'm glad that we had the opportunity. And thank you so much, Mike, for demoing this. Oh, absolutely, because this, this um, really helps people, gives them a lot of information. And thank you so much for all the information and everything that you guys absolutely, do. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.